16 by 9, the bigger picture. Small East Coast towns were first to get hooked, but the OxyContin addiction quickly blew west. Thousands of Canadians were looking for help. What they found was hell. I just found it extremely difficult that it was a legal drug that did this. I was put on this medication, became a raging addict, basically. In the wrong patient, at the wrong dose, the side effects can be fatal. That's all coming up on 16 by 9. Here's Mary Garofalo. Good evening and welcome to 16 by 9, The Bigger Picture. Are we a pill-popping nation addicted to prescription drugs? And could your family doctor unknowingly be your drug dealer? Well, when it comes to the highly popular and addictive painkiller, OxyContin, are we dying by prescription? Well, tonight our Jennifer Tryon investigates what some argue is Canada's biggest pharmaceutical cover-up. This was his bedroom. Um, that's where he died. Ada Thompson has kept her son's bedroom pretty much as it stood six years ago. He was found on his side. Michael was a car buff, loved Mustangs, ran his own construction business until he got sick. Kidney stones, not a serious health threat, but painful. Michael was living with us at home. He had a bout of kidney stones. He was doubled over in pain, and I took him to the emergency department. The doctor gave us a prescription. That prescription was for Percocet, and that's what started it all. What started was a dependency. At the time, Ada started noticing changes in his behavior. He loved his work. I was very proud of him. And then all of a sudden, I could see a disinterest in even family. He pulled away uh, from friends and people that he was very close to. Michael became increasingly withdrawn. All he wanted to do, it seemed, was sleep, sometimes right through the alarm. I turned off his alarm clock and I noticed his breathing was a little shallow. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to turn him around so he gets more air. Twelve hours later, Michael, just 29 years old, was dead. Michael had overdosed on the pain medications his doctor had prescribed. The coroner explained that Michael would have stopped breathing and then his heart went into palpitations, and then cardiac arrest. So I just found it extremely um, difficult that it was a legal drug that did this. Michael's toxicology report found high levels of the ingredient oxycodone found in the prescription painkillers he was prescribed, such as hydromorphone and oxycontin. Incredibly, Michael had been prescribed a cocktail of eight different types of prescription drugs, resulting in more than 13,000 of those pills in just 14 months. That works out to more than 30 pills a day. I don't want to blame the doctors and paint them all with the same brush because there are good doctors, but I think they have to change that standard of care to find the cause of the problem and not just medicate the symptom of pain for people. Ada sued her son's doctor and won. His license was suspended, at least temporarily, and he was sanctioned. But in the six months since all that happened, Ada says not much has changed. And although celebrities such as Heath Ledger, Michael Jackson, and recently Corey Haim are grabbing the headlines, the reality is the profile of users is shifting. Certainly there are people of low income who uh, die from opioids, but there are also people of high incomes. This man, Dr. Irfan Dalla, knows the impact of OxyContin and how it cuts across all segments of society. He's a doctor and a researcher at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. All physicians, I would say, know that opioids can have serious side effects, but what they may be surprised to find is just how many people are dying from prescription opioids. Dr. Dalla and his research team recently published a study in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, noting that drugs like OxyContin are killing users in Ontario at twice the rate they were in 1991. 
In fact, the rate of deaths involving narcotic painkillers went from 13.7 per million in 1991 to 27.2 per million in 2004. And prescriptions for OxyContin have increased by more than 850 percent during the study period from 1991 to 2007. Why the surge? OxyContin was added to the list of drugs covered by Ontario's health plan. After OxyContin was introduced in 2000, deaths related to oxycodone, the drug that's in OxyContin, rose fivefold. There were between three and 400 deaths each year from prescription opioids. In comparison, this year so far, there have been about 100 deaths in Ontario from H1N1. There'll probably be about 100, 150 from HIV AIDS in Ontario in a year. In comparison, it's a big problem. The startling fact is that opiates such as OxyContin are prescribed and used in Canada more than anywhere else in the world. Canadians first began hearing about OxyContin almost a decade ago, not as an effective painkiller, but as a cheap and easy way to get high. Known as hillbilly heroin, when the drug is chewed or crushed and inhaled, it produces a rapid heroin-like effect euphoria. But when OxyContin was first introduced, it was promoted by its manufacturer, Purdue Pharma, as a safer, less addictive alternative to morphine. David Seal was also told OxyContin is a better alternative to morphine when he was diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome. Basically, I started getting really sick my last year of university. Wake up in the middle of the night and with horrible, horrible stomach pains and throwing up and I would get so bad that um, instead of it just lasting 8 to 12 hours, it was a couple days. And when I was discharged, on my discharge plan was morphine to mask the pain. David told his doctor he didn't want morphine. So he put me on OxyContin that you take every 12 hours. His doctor assured him this was far less addictive. He said, don't worry about it, we'll wean you down slowly and get you right off of it. Trusted him and you take it like you should be and you just trust that your doctor will be there for you. Instead, David found he couldn't live without it. He was hooked and slowly but surely kept asking for more and higher doses and he got it. You build up a, a tolerance to it. Your body's used to having this in its system and you need um, more to have the same effect that you that it was having on you. Doctors don't really seem to realize that, or at least mine didn't. But David knew he had a problem. That's the worst feeling in the world, knowing that you you need something to get out of bed. And I had never had a problem with drugs, alcohol, anything before I was placed on this. I mean, I didn't smoke cigarettes, so you know, nothing. And I was put on this medication and became a raging addict. David's doctor started to realize the problem as well, but the promise to slowly wean David off OxyContin was not working. David said his doctor got scared and abandoned him. I honestly didn't think that there was anything that was going to save me. I just thought that was it. You know, I was basically hopeless. According to Dr. Irfan Dalla, it's a thin line when you're dealing with OxyContin. Our main message is to doctors that they need to be very careful about the amount of uh, opioids that they're prescribing and in particular perhaps OxyContin. I think it is my duty as a mother who has lost a child to let people know because the government isn't doing that. They are afraid to use the word heroin. Um, they think it'll frighten people away from taking it. Well, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Still to come on 16 by 9. Give the same knife to a criminal and the outcome is totally different. The problem is not in the knife, it's how and why it was used. That's all coming up. Welcome back to 16 by 9, the bigger picture. When OxyContin hit the market, it became an instant success. Finally, a drug that could relieve pain all day long. It became a wonderful alternative to addictive narcotic pain pills. Prescriptions for OxyContin soared, but it wasn't long before harrowing stories of addiction, abuse, and side effects began to surface. 
Here again is our Jennifer Tryon. New Waterford, Nova Scotia on Cape Breton Island. It's here that Oxycontin had already made a name for itself on the streets. But addiction problems are nothing new here. When I first came here, cocaine was relatively new to the community and caused a number of incidents. We've had problems with opioids, although much more so over the past 10 years or so. Dr. Peter Littlejohn practices family medicine out of this small rural office. You have to kind of be a jack of all trades when you practice in a small town. I'm not sure about expert, but you do what you can. He's been doing it for 34 years, sewing up cuts, delivering babies, and yes, treating chronic pain. Dr. Little John was typical of the small town physician, targeted by many drug companies, including reps from the makers of OxyContin, Purdue Pharma. So tell me some of the ways that you were educated on OxyContin. People would come down from uh, Halifax or from Ontario and make presentations on the use of medications for chronic pain and, and oftentimes not just uh, opioids. But paid for by Purdue. Many of them were, yes, indeed. The person who detailed uh, that particular drug was uh, very supportive in providing uh, excellent lectures and funding experts to come in and, and pr provide knowledge and resource on chronic pain management. Uh, and I don't think that the, uh, that was done unethically here. And what he heard made sense. OxyContin was supposed to be less addictive, have fewer side effects than other painkillers. The drug manufacturer, Purdue Pharma, marketed OxyContin as a miracle pill for anyone in constant pain. Just look at this ad from the Journal of the American Medical Association, also widely read by Canadian doctors, showing patients getting their lives back, all completely pain-free thanks to OxyContin. Figures and graphs like this were distributed to physicians promoting OxyContin's steady 12-hour protection. From coast to coast, ads, textbooks, medical conferences, all sang the praises of OxyContin's superior slow-release formula. So Dr. Peter Littlejohn began writing out prescriptions for OxyContin, lots of them. The people that you were prescribing OxyContin to, were they regular people that needed treatment for pain? Oh yes, uh, they were not uh, people who uh, were going to the street for opioids. They were coming to you? They, they were coming to have their pain managed and uh, that's largely the vast majority of cases. And as far as managing pain, well, OxyContin got the job done. The twin uh, necessities of getting comfort and functionality, I think, for the majority of people were probably fairly well met. Not everyone saw it that way. Dr. Littlejohn was writing too many prescriptions for OxyContin, prescribing doses that were too high. Patients complained. And in 2006, the Nova Scotia College of Physicians and Surgeons stripped him of his narcotics license for five years. Okay, here we go. A Cape Breton doctor is prohibited from writing prescriptions for narcotics as defined by the criminal code for the next five years. For Dr. Peter Littlejohn, this came as a big surprise. What went wrong then? On a personal note, I think uh, the ambition to, to try and treat pain, perhaps not the regard for um, dosing. Dr. Ray Azir is another family doctor in the same community. He says dealing with Oxycontin is a double-edged sword. It is a wonderful pain medication if it is used properly. Best way to look at it is think about a knife in the hand of a chef. He would make a wonderful meal with that knife, give the same knife to a criminal, and the outcome is totally different. The problem is not in the knife, it's how and why it was used. How does it need to be used properly? What is the key? The, the key thing is always patient selection. You cannot give the same drug to anybody and expect to have the same result. But Dr. Raiz Azir says there's a catch. Most doctors get very little pain training to even know how to select the right patient. Who do you think had more training in pain management? A recent survey from the University of Toronto posed this question. Who in Canadian medical schools gets the most training in pain management? The answer? Veterinarians. Veterinarians got five times more pain training compared to physicians who got double what the nurses got. This gap in training is something drug companies can easily try and fill.
This is a textbook managing pain. Maybe you've yes, seen it. Yes, I have that and the and the updated copy. It's one of the few Canadian resources on pain management. The same book given to students at U of T. And if you look closely, you'll notice it's published by the makers of OxyContin, Purdue Pharma. Hmm. Well, as I say, I, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe your job as a journalist is to find out what the intent was. In a newer version of the text, all of those claims about OxyContin being less addictive and having fewer side effects are gone. And today's ads for OxyContin now warn of the potential for abuse and addiction. So in 2006, which is the year that all of this happened for you, this book, Managing Pain, the Canadian Healthcare Professionals Reference, mm -hmm. published by Purdue Pharma, mm. suggests that the slow-release formula, which is OxyContin, has lower abuse potential, fewer persistent side effects, fewer peaks and valleys than other opioids. It clearly says something which you now know to be incorrect. Whether it was done with intent is, is difficult to say. Still to come on 16 by 9. We're talking about the mislabeling, the misbranding, and the misinformation. And the profits that they earned as a result of that should be returned to those people that have suffered harm as a result of its use. That's all coming up. We're back with the bigger picture. OxyContin was a big money maker for the pharmaceutical company that developed it, convincing doctors it was a safer, less addictive painkiller. But in the U.S., that company made a shocking admission. It lied, purposely misleading doctors and the public, all in the name of pill-popping profit. That left claims from thousands of Americans and Canadians who were hooked like drug addicts. More now from Jennifer Tryon. Pleaded guilty, misled, lied to doctors, highly addictive, deadly pill. Guilty to misbranding, misleading marketing. The maker of OxyContin, Purdue Pharma's top executives, Michael Friedman, president and CEO, and the company's medical director, Paul Goldenheim, and lawyer, Howard Udell. All three executives and the company pled guilty in the U.S. to misleading regulators, physicians, and patients about OxyContin's risk of addiction and potential for abuse. The fine, $634 million, the biggest drug settlement ever. Purdue Pharma heavily promoted OxyContin to doctors like general practitioners, who often had little training in the treatment of serious pain or in recognizing signs of drug abuse in patients. But the company claims that only happened south of the border. It would seem Halifax serious injury lawyer Ray Wagner is walking into the easiest case of his career, a legal slam dunk. After all, the criminal case has already been settled in the U.S. with an admission of guilt. What are you going for in Canada? We're talking about the mislabeling, the misbranding, and the misinformation. And the profits that they earned as a result of that should be returned to those people that have suffered harm as a result of its use. Any idea how much that might be? I believe that they've uh, up to between 1995 and to, to approximately 2005, I think, believe their profits were up around $2.8 billion. Now that's, that's worldwide, of course, in terms of marketing the drug. So you can see the proportions in Canada, uh, uh, when you take that into account, it's hundreds of millions of dollars. American court documents obtained by 16 by 9 reveal executives at Purdue Pharma's U.S. operation designed the misleading campaign for one purpose, to boost sales and drive profits. And there was never any proof that OxyContin, as Purdue was fond of suggesting, was any better than morphine. Dr. Peter Littlejohn, who is still being punished for over-prescribing OxyContin, now concedes he would have done things differently. I think my level of suspicion was probably not tweaked as high as it could have been. It's probably you know, a very stressful area of practice uh, to, to prescribe uh, potentially addictive drugs. You weren't given all the information either. Uh, no, but nonetheless, I firmly believe that uh, I have responsibility to practice properly with the information you have. The U.S. court documents also reveal how Purdue sales reps were trained to pitch the drug. They could tell healthcare providers that OxyContin potentially caused less chance for addiction and patients who took OxyContin would not develop a tolerance for the drug. 
The patient doesn't know better, and so they go to the doctor, they rely on the doctor, the doctor has been misinformed, and they're sent off. And the problem is, is that everybody's all innocent about this. And, you know, the only people that know about it are the people that are branding the drug or making the drug. Documents also show that even when concerns were raised to produce supervisors, the company did nothing because it didn't want to affect the unique position that OxyContin had in many physicians' minds. Were Canadians con too? Oh, for sure. We wanted to put that and other questions about misleading marketing practices directly to Purdue, but the company turned down our requests for an interview. They sent this email instead. Purdue Pharma Canada operates in a distinct and different regulatory and business environment in Canada. We develop our own marketing plans independent of those in the U.S. But that's a line Halifax attorney Ray Wagner simply doesn't buy. Nor do the 100 Canadian families he's representing in a Canadian class action lawsuit against Purdue. I mean, you can't say, you know, not international uh, pharmaceutical companies don't create a marketing strategy uh, for, one con for one country and not for an another. David Seal and his mother have joined the class action lawsuit, seeking a portion of the profits Purdue made from the sale of OxyContin in Canada. I basically lost two years of my life just now getting, getting back on track. I will always be a recovering addict. I mean, that never goes away. How they're allowed to get away with it boggles my mind. Ada Thompson isn't sitting idle any longer. She's tired of waiting for governments to take action. Hi, Kevin. Oh, I see something here. Prescription opioids, yeah. Painkillers, are you addicted? Wonderful. Having lost her son, she's a mother turned crusader. If I need more, I can just sure. call you up yeah. and you can print yeah, more for me. She's on a personal mission to warn Canadians about the dangers of prescription drugs. Now, where do we put the first one? Especially the kind that killed her son. I like what it says, and hopefully people will get the message, yeah. She's targeting the professional bodies that represent doctors and pharmacists. But for Ada, this is ground zero. The place where her first lawn sign will go. The spot where her 29-year-old son is buried. I used to come every day just because I knew I could be close to him, his body was there, that's all I had. Ada doesn't much care whether Purdue is forced to pay a big settlement in Canada. No amount of money can bring Michael back. What she wants is something far more permanent. She wants OxyContin banned. His death was preventable. And I think people will listen and people will become more cautious and I hope they don't take them. And that's it for us tonight. If you have a story idea, just call us at 1-877-TELL-69 or visit our website at global16by9.com. I'm Mary Garofello. Thank you for watching and from all of us here, good night. If you've got a story idea for 16x9, call our tip line. Sixteen by nine, the bigger picture. That's a wrap.